Okay, now we can start. Oh, yeah. Um, so Viet and I know each other from a while back. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was right before he got very famous for winning the Pulitzer Prize that he blurbed my book, so I got in there just in the nick of time. Um, so thank you very much, Viet. Um, and then we've also done a few projects together, uh, a children's book uh, called Chicken of the Sea, which I got to do with your son Ellison when he was only five, mm -hmm. I believe, and my son was 13 at the time. They're much bigger now, um, but we go back a ways, and so I think that's why we wanted to start a little bit casual and reveal that we did go out drinking and karaoke last mm. night. Um, that's how I like to prepare for my book talks. Um, but I also have... Uh, <laughs> Like an inordinate amount of pages that I have tagged here. Um, and I'm going to try to keep it limited because I know our time is short. So I'm just going to cut to the heart of it, Viet. Why did you write a memoir? I think of you as this very intellectual dude who I followed on Facebook for your political opinions. They're always so like well articulated that then I'm like, great, now I don't have to try to write something intelligent about this thing that's upsetting me. Um, and you've also written, of course, like academic books uh, and dealing with the the same questions that have like perturbed me for my entire life, um, but you also do it in this very articulate professorial way. You are in fact a professor. Um, and then the sympathizer, very, very well known, very well lauded, um, also really hard to understand for a lot of normal people. <laughs> um, and then now you've got this mm. memoir, and I remember when I wrote a memoir, you acted like you were never gonna write a memoir, mm -hmm. but now you've done it. Why did you write a memoir? Okay, great. Uh, let me just point out one thing, which is one of the other projects we did was for T's paperback edition of the best we could do. If, if you haven't had it, if you don't have it, you should get it because T, did, yeah, absolutely. But in particular, the paperback edition, because T wanted to do something special for that, so she interviewed me uh, for that and drew a cartoon. Uh, that is the preface for The Best We Could Do, and it's on the very important subject of my hair. I mean, seriously, that, uh, we just, I don't know, that's what we talked about. Um, and so I thought, oh, I should pursue this autobiographical thing, so I can talk more about my hair. But, uh, <laughs> you know, what happened was I, I started, um, as you said, I'm a, I'm a professor, and I became a professor because this was my compromise with my parents. You know, my parents are Vietnamese refugees. They obviously wanted their kids to do things like become doctors and so on. My older brother became a doctor um, with degrees from Harvard and Stanford, all this, all this wonderful stuff. And I, I became an English major at the, the University of Communists at Berkeley. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I survived the, the refugee experience. Um, it, it, my refugee experience wasn't any, anything nearly as bad as what my parents went through because I was four years old when we became refugees. However, I witnessed my parents living the refugee life, running a grocery store in San Jose, California in the 70s and the 80s. I felt like I was an eyewitness to their trauma. And being an eyewitness to someone's trauma is also tr kind of traumatic too. I mean, it's not the same, but it, it did affect me pretty deeply and in ways that I did not understand. I thought I became very well adjusted. And then I met my future wife um, and you know, we spent a little bit of time together and I said, I, th I think I'm pretty well adjusted, aren't I? And she said, no, you are not well adjusted. <laughs> um, Oh, well, I mean, she proved to be right, as she always is, but it would take me about 20 or 30 years to figure out that my well-adjustment was actually my way of just uh, tamping down all forms of emotional um, sensitivity and nuance on my part in order to do things like become a professor and be very analytical and all this. And so becoming a writer and writing The Sympathizer and other things was really my, um, my attempt to break away from all that analysis and to also be creative. And um, in The Sympathizer, if you've read the book, okay, let me say this, there's a TV series coming out in a few weeks, okay, from HBO or Max. Um, and so if you haven't read The Sympathizer, you never have to read The Sympathizer. You can just watch it on TV now. But, um, you know, I, I, that, that character of The Sympathizer is not me. You know, he's a half French, half Vietnamese spy who does, you know, terrible things. And, but what is in him that is me are autobiographical feelings and ideas, just heavily masked under his character. And the more I wrote, the more I realized that in order for my own writing to have any kind of power, it, the power comes not just from ideas and from stories and so on, but from emotions. And so the, the only place to find those emotions is inside of me. And so the more time I spent writing and the more time I spent going up and you know, giving these kinds of talks and, and interacting with people, and the more I was talking about the stories of my family, the more I realized, in fact, yes, I am deeply, deeply messed up by <laughs> everything we had been through. 
Um, and so that was then the compulsion to write this book, uh, the Man of Two Fa a Man of Two Faces. Um, and the only way I could write this book, uh, because I did not want to write about myself, the only way I could really write this book was to pretend that I was the sympathizer writing as Viet Thanh Nguyen. Um, and so that's why it's a man of two faces. He's a man of two faces. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a man of at least two faces. And, uh, you know, there is, it, it, there is, it, it is definitely a memoir in the sense that it talks about my life and my parents' lives and talks about some very intimate things. But I also had to do it my way as well. And so there is a lot of, the, the subtitle is deliberately a memoir, a history, a memorial, because in addition to the memoir, there is my version of US history and world history, which not everybody will agree with, and, and there's a memorial. I mean, it's, it's also an act of mourning and grieving um, for my mother, who passed away in 2018 after a long illness and uh, struggle with mental health. And um, as I, I th somewhere in the book I say, you know, writing is the only way I know how to grieve. And so this was my act of grieving for my mother. Whew, that, that was a long, I, I have so many responses to that, but I'm gonna try to backtrack to um, this idea of uh, the, the, the man of two faces and the, your resistance to doing anything the easy way or the simple way. Um, and I just wanna state the obvious about like, we're both Vietnamese, we're both writers, we're both Vietnamese American, and then we have this like subtitle under our panel, writing the Vietnamese American story, which is a little bit like a trick question on a test, right? Like, um, this is a trap. So can you, can you, you've talked in other interviews about resisting the ethnic memoir, and I know, I think the problem is felt among many people, but people have different solutions to that problem. Some people say, well, I'm not ethnic then, um, I'm just an author. You have a different response to this problem of writing the ethnic memoir, can you explain? Hmm. Sure, I mean, um, look, uh, <laughs> We live in a country, this is my interpretation of U.S. history, you can disagree with me, okay? I mean, we live in a country that uh, is, is itself now con a contradictory country. That's why we have these very serious political, cultural conflicts and divisions. But these are not, this is not a new contradiction. I mean, for me, the contradiction goes back to the very origins of what the United States is, how it was founded, which is as a country of freedom and democracy, and also as a country built on enslavement, genocide, colonialism, and war. And it's, 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 there, there is no resolution to this contradiction. It's just something, I think there is, but it's far in the future, a utopian future. But in the present, we have to, we have to live with this contradiction, that whole F. Scott Fitzgerald idea. You have to have, you have, to have a, a, the, the sign of a first-rate intelligence is to hold two opposing ideas in your head at the same time. And we live in a country in which a lot of people do not want to do that. They want to have this idea or that idea, but they don't want to figure out how the two opposing ideas can exist simultaneously. What that means in response to your question is that for us to be Vietnamese Americans in this country is a living embodiment of that contradiction. Um, of course, then you have people saying, I don't want to be a hyphenated American. I don't want to be trapped by history. I, I just want to start fresh. I want to be a human being. And that's the other side of things. And honestly, you can't. You cannot do that. Um, but you want, but it's important to hold on to that belief that we should all be human. We should all be unmarked writers. And yet I'm constantly reminded that I'm not an unmarked writer because I'm often introduced as a Vietnamese American writer. And I have no problem with that. Call me a Vietnamese American writer, call me an Asian American writer, but if you do that, then when you introduce Jonathan Franzen, you gotta call him the white male American writer. It's adjectives for all or adjectives for none. And we don't live in that country yet. We don't live in that country. We live in a country that produces adjectives because it's fundamentally built into our country that the adjectives are a sign of the legacy of history of racial and class and gender exploitation and everything else that is still a part of us. So there is no simple answer to what you say. And then so far as, as the ethnic memoir goes, I, you know, when you, when you hear the bare bones of my family's story, many of you will have a, a, a narrative already ready to hear my family's story, okay? My parents were poor, they grew up in, in a divided country that was war-torn by colonialism and things like this. They fled twice, lost their fortune, rebuilt their fortune, came to this country, um, had sons who became very successful, and they, they retired, you know, wealthy. And uh, if you were to hear that story, I think many Americans' reactions would be, good for you. That is the classical immigrant American dream story. Life kind of sucked over there. We know that, that those are the you know what countries. 
And then you came here, and yes, we're not a perfect country yet, so we know that the immigrants and the refugees experienced racism. Are, we're sorry, we're liberals, we recognize that. Uh, and then, uh, no matter what happened to your parents or your grandparents, look at you. You won the Pulitzer Prize. You are the walking embodiment of the American dream. That's how the book is gonna be interpreted, even by very intelligent people. And so, I. I felt like I had to write a book which acknowledged the, the actual facts of the story as I just recounted them, but then also forced readers to confront the very formulas that they use to interpret the stories. So if you want to, there's a whole there's like a whole section here where I tell you how to write the ethnic autobiographical bestseller. There's five steps. <laughs> you have to buy the book. I'm not gonna tell you. You have to buy the book and read it, or borrow it and read it. And I'll lay you the five steps of how to write the ethnic bestseller. Um, because I've read a lot of these so-called ethnic memoirs, and they're very, uh, and I'm, they're all very heartfelt, and they all have very important human stories to tell, but they also fit a formula for acceptability for American audiences. Yeah, I, do you mind? Can can I give them just a tiny taste? Sure. But there are, I mean, there are some really laugh out loud moments in this, and I think the bonus points in that re recipe for your ethnic memoir bestseller. <laughs> Um, that that made me really laugh was um, on translating or like like incorporating food into your uh, memoir. Um, can I just can I could I read from your sure, book? Go, go. That would be fun. Um, for example, you could write. I introduced my corn-fed Iowa-raised fiance to a bowl of my mother's delicious pho, a beef broth noodle soup that every Vietnamese person loves. And while this might pass some 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 people's standards, you do point out <laughs> a really great point, which is no one ever wonders if the great white American male novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald ever wrote in an early draft of The Great Gatsby, I offered Daisy a delicious sandwich, two slices of bread between which there is something delicious. <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much. I made you, I made you a valentine. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, this, this is what you get when you invite a cartoonist to interview you about your book. I, I, put, I uh, yeah, made a lot of hearts in here. Um, so the thing is, you're a little bit prickly, and I just want to point that out if it's not obvious <laughs> yet. You know, you're not, you don't portray yourself as like a, like a soft person, like a loving character, and, you, and, and you're a little bit hard on yourself in your, in your testimony about yourself, in your interviews, in your own writing. You're quite tough on yourself, um, and I wonder if uh, writing this memoir has broken you <laughs> a little bit and like made you a little bit outwardly softer at all. Um, hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, first of all, if you write a memoir and you're not hard on yourself, you're not writing a memoir. I mean, like, why? Why, why would you do that? Why would, you, why would I write a book that just criticizes other people? I mean, it's fun, but, <laughs> you know, or exposes other people's secrets. I mean, in order to write a memoir, you, you have to sort of expose yourself. And we all have secrets of various kinds. We all have various, you know, things we don't want other people to see. And the powerful thing about a, a good memoir is that when I've read them and, I, and, and, and the, the memoirist reveals themselves, I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe they said that part out loud. Mm -hmm. Because it's true. I feel it too. I just never thought anybody else felt that as well. So I think it's a sign of a good memoir. So you have to engage in the act of, of self-exposure. But the, the, the issue, I think, in, in the United States but in other, other countries is that the memoir is a very individualistic form. Mm -hmm. we, we pick up a memoir because we want the, the writer to spill their guts in front of us. And then after we're done, we're like, nice. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm happy I've seen your guts all over the place and, and all of that. And, and for me, that does happen in the book, uh, but there's also a collective spilling of the guts mm -hmm. as well, because I want, to, I want to eviscerate American history. You know, I, wanna, I, I don't want to just expose myself. I want to expose what I think of this country and other countries that I've been involved with also. Um, because then that's, that's the part of the ethnic memoir, the so-called ethnic memoir, that non, so-called non-ethnic readers don't want to hear. They want to hear the ethnic memoirist expose Chinese patriarchy or foot binding or you know how, how awful Asian fathers and men happen to be without connecting it to whatever's happening in this country, right? So that's, that's something this memoir refuses to do. And it does it with hopefully some some good humor. I mean, if you get to the end, there's a whole page of one-star reviews of the sympathizer that I took from Amazon.com. I have a sense of humor about myself, okay? And I confess that I read my Amazon.com reviews. 
And I confess that the worst kind of Amazon.com review or Goodreads review is not the one-star review. It's the three-star review. <laughs> it's like, ugh, what, what? You're gonna, you know, they actually offer critical assessments that I don't like. But the one-star review, the one-star review is hilarious. It's, yeah. like, it's like, this is disgusting. And this won the Pulitzer Prize and all this kind of stuff. And right. so um, I, I tell the story of the, Pul- of the sympathizer in one-star reviews. I think it's hilarious. Yeah, uh, the last one is amazing. One-star, good book. Yeah, one-star, good book. Okay. <laughs> Um, but you said, am I softer now as a, yeah, as a result are you, of writing? Are you a bit softer, you think? Uh, yeah, definitely. I've been tenderized by writing my own memoir. No, it's true. It's, it's true. I mean, like, I mean, it's been really interesting becoming a writer because, um, you know, when I wrote The Sympathizer, it's actually a pretty funny book if you, if you bother to read it. And, uh, it uh, but most of my friends uh, up until that point never thought that I had a sense of humor because I'm a very serious person. Um, and they're like, wow, Viet had a sense of humor, and he's making these awful scatological jokes and things like this in, in The Sympathizer. And it's like, I've always been doing it in my head the entire time. And then writing the memoir, so that brought out the sense of humor in me, the, 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 the fact that The Sympathizer and its sequel, The Committed, are very satirical, uh, vulgar uh, novels. And this book is, is uh, uh, satirical and vulgar, but it's also got a lot of tenderness in it. And I had to... That, that was actually really hard, really, really hard for me to do that. Um, and I, I, it must have worked because the Financial Times just published this profile they did with me. And the writer's first paragraph is to say, you know, he comes off as this sort of hard, analytical, intellectual kind of person. But after spending two hours with him, I realized at the, at the core of it all, he's mush. <laughs> and so there it is. Okay, so I, I, I've been working to be more vulnerable. And I think, you know, when I was growing up and well into my adulthood, I thought, I thought of vulnerability as weakness, and you know, it, it was not something to be betrayed. Uh, in order to survive in academia, for example, if you betray vulnerability, you're dead. Um, so that was what I internalized. You know, in order to survive the refugee experience, survive academia, survive the meritocracy of American culture, I had to be invulnerable. Um, and then I would, I would encounter people who were vulnerable, and it made me very uncomfortable. Other people's vulnerability made me very uncomfortable. I could tell. Oh, you really? Yeah. How? Well, I mean... <laughs> Still? Yeah. No, no, you've gotten softer. Yeah, I've gotten softer, yeah. right? But, but when I, I asked yeah. you about your hair, that was a euphemism. Really? Yeah, well, because uh. your hair is very hard uh. and polished. <laughs> Mine's not. I, I didn't get it. I would I was like, like it to I, be sometimes. I thought we were just celebrating my hair, but you were actually exposing me. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But I, I discovered that, that being vulnerable actually requires a lot of strength, you know, for you to expose yourself emotionally to other people. And it's an act of giving, I think, to be, to be vulnerable in, in many circumstances. And so, you know, um, not to be too sentimental about it, but I think uh, my course as a writer and as a husband and as a father uh, has, has led me to, to recognize the strength in vulnerability, the strength in love, the strength in giving, all kinds of things that I would have completely dismissed when I was 21 years old. Again, I think you're being a little bit harsh on yourself. Um, so I think sometimes when you are so successful and you know have really put yourself out there a lot um, and people put you on a pedestal a lot and it's not your fault, other, you get a lot of haters. And I'm always out there defending you saying, you don't know <laughs> how nice this guy is and how giving he has been to other writers, um, me included. But I, I want to—I was noticing that you never use the words trauma or healing in your own memoir. But I was like thinking to myself, wait a minute, you used that in your in your blurb for my book. You said it was a book to break your heart and heal it. He you used the word heal, so you pushed that on me. <laughs> and I'm like, you heal people. Like you've—you know, do you, you are such a skeptic. I think about. Uh, your own ability to love and show emotion, and you're skeptical about uh, wholeness. And I, I, I actually made a little heartbreak Valentine for you because I was like so sad to read that. I was like, really? You don't expect a return to wholeness? You don't believe in the wholeness or authenticity? Does that mean no healing for Viet? Oh wow! It, it literally is a broken heart. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna leave it right here. Oh uh, yeah. Um, you know, oh gosh, <laughs> um, 
Well, it goes back to the idea of, of contradictions and of paradoxes. And, you know, again, when I was in college and I was at Berkeley and everything, I wanted absolute clarity. Mm -hmm. I wanted revolution. I wanted linearity. I wanted clear solutions. Um, everything was very simple for me then um, as I looked at the world's very complicated problems and as, as I hid away from my own complicated problems. And so now I just feel that I, I, I think it's important for me to be able to embrace paradox and contradiction mm -hmm. and to, to realize that I'm not going to untangle all of these things. And so I can hope for healing and yet also believe that it's also impossible in certain, certain ways. And by that I mean that some people, you know, again, the memoir elicits these ideas from readers oftentimes that yes, people write memoirs because they've been traumatized. If you don't, if, why write a memoir if you haven't been damaged horribly in some way, okay? We don't want to read about your happiness, okay? No one, no one cares. Um, <laughs> So then you've been damaged horribly in some way and you write the memoir and then people expect healing out of that. It's a very American thing, like we've gotten over it. You know, we've, been th we've, self we've treated ourselves and all of that. And, and, and in some ways I believe in that. You know, I, mm -hmm. I believe it's, it's, uh, that's possible, I hope so. I mean, I, I've met lots of damaged people and for whom I hope that they, they get healed or their children do and so on. So I, I do believe in that possibility. However, again, I, I don't think that for a lot of people the, the damage is not just individual. You know, it could be the case that you had a really screwed up parent, et cetera, and, and, uh, and they did some terrible things to you and, and vice versa. And so maybe you could heal that. But for a lot of us, for a lot of people, the damage is collective as well as individual, right. okay? We, we have damaged families, we have damaged parents, we have damaged communities, not because these individuals are themselves inherently screwed up, but because history messed with them, mm -hmm. you know? They were mm -hmm. subjected to war, to colonization, to displacement, all these things that they had no control over. And so the memoir is partly about, when I look at my mother, for example, you know, uh, I, 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 and I, I just don't know whether she was damaged because she survived 40 years, literally 40 years of colonization and war from the 1930s to the 1970s, or whether it was something individual within her psyche that was broken and, what, and that even without the war, she would have ended up the way that, that she did, you know, visiting um, um, a mental facility three times in her life. I don't know, you know, and that's the mystery. That's the mystery that the book cannot resolve. And what that means is that, you know, individual healing is important. I would have loved for my mother to have been healed, and she wasn't. But the conditions, the collective conditions that created a refugee community um, that messed up millions of people, those conditions haven't gone away. And so I, I'm, I'm concerned that the language of individual healing is de deceptive. It allows us to feel that catharsis of you got, you got over your problems, there, right. therefore everything is fine in the world when the world remains broken, right? right? And so that's what the book is also about. Like, again, confronting the, the difference and the overlap between our individual brokenness and the collective brokenness of our communities. I love it when you write that the uh, solution to colonization is, it's not self-healing necessarily, it's decolonization. Um, can you explain what decolonization is exactly? I think, you know, like a lot of the, um, you know, again, we as a country, some of us, many of us recognize that we've had enduring problems around race and, and, and capitalism and gender and patriarchy and all these kinds of things. And we have sort of a ready-made language now to address those things, diversity, equity, inclusion, and so on, which I'm deeply cynical about you know, the language of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm deeply cynical about it. And yet, at the same time, these terms still have a lot of political meaning because now we have a huge backlash against DEI, exactly. So somebody's taking it seriously out there that, that DEI efforts are meant to completely undermine American society. Um, and yet, from my perspective, DEI doesn't go far enough. Mm -hmm. um, so when I say decolonization, I think about the fact that, you know, for, for me, when I look at the United States, m my way of understanding our country is that it's inseparable from colonialism. America as a whole, I mean, all, you know, the vast idea of America, not just the United States, but I, America as a whole, wouldn't exist except for European colonization. Um, that's a process that took half a millennia, at least, and it's, it's something that is not past. You know, my interpretation of the United States is that we are, in fact, a settler colonial country, by which I mean, I mean and many others mean, that settlers who did not live here, came here, took over, took over everything, and built this country that we live in, and many of us derive enormous 
um, uh, privilege from that, including someone like me, you know, and this is part of the contradiction. Like I came as a refugee to this country and if you come as a refugee or you come as any kind of, you have any kind of so-called minority identity, it's really easy to be tempted to, to dwell on your own victimization, mm -hmm. right? And the paradox is that for Vietnamese refugees who come here, many of us have been victimized in various ways, or our parents have been, and yet we come here, and those of us who become citizens and who become successful, we participate in all of the other privileges of being a part of a settler colonial country, um, built on you know the, the the sufferings of indigenous peoples and colonized peoples and enslaved peoples and on the lands that we have conquered as a country and which are now ours. Um, so that paradox doesn't go away. That paradox is still uh, with us. And so when I think about a name for a political project that I want to be engaged in, it, like you know, empowerment or diversity or representation or inclusion, they're not enough. I mean, they're important in the short term because I want to be included too. You know, you do. I'm here. I'm, I'm included. I'm, I'm here. I'm, I have all these privileges. But for me, the larger framework is decolonization because in order for us to... Um, Go back to that idea of the more perfect union. What does that even mean? If, if we want to go to that, if we genuinely take that seriously, it means decolonization. It means you know centuries and centuries of effort to undo the centuries and centuries of exploitation that has created this country in the, per in the first place. And that's, I think, is a hard thing for, for many people to face. It would mean giving up power for, for, for some people. Mm -hmm. They don't want to do that. Um, but I guess I, there's like... There is a hopefulness that I sense in you, in spite of everything. Um, would you say that you're an optimist about this project? Uh, that's going pretty far, T. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm writing these lectures for Harvard that I'm delivering, and the last lecture is on the joy of otherness, and I start off by saying, this is such a hard thing to write about, because I have to talk about joy or optimism and so on. And so I, I, I would say no, though, but you know, here's where I'm mushy. Like I am, I am an optimist, mm -hmm. but I'm only about a 10% optimist. So if it's like a cocktail, that's like the equivalent of the vermouth you put into a martini. Um, <laughs> and so I'm, a lot of me is still pessimistic because obviously the struggle is very, very real. The struggle is very, very hard to carry out this project of decolonization that I'm, that I'm thinking about. But I'm, I'm an optimist in the sense that I, I look at human history, at least the part that we can remember, and I can look back and think, wow, you know, a thousand years ago, we as human beings were killing each other because we lived in different villages or different towns. And that was our, those were our identities on which we were going to organize and murder other people. And now we do it at the level of the nation state. I'm like, well, that's pretty depressing. Um, but, but, and it seems insurmountable to, to imagine a world in which nation states are no longer the primary ways by which we, we, we organize our, our imagined communities. And so I'm, I'm optimistic in that sense, that 500 or 1,000 years from now, if we survive nuclear war and everything else, climate catastrophe, yes. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about kids for a second. So I think the way that <clears throat> I think the way that I find a little bit of hope on, on hard days where it, it's really difficult to see the point in, in getting up and, and going through the day, I think about the seasons. Um, you know, you go through winter, but then eventually it's spring again, and spring is pretty great. And I think that the children that come into our lives bring this feeling of springtime back again. Um, can you talk about becoming a father and um, like the, the ways that it has probably made you mushy to be a father, but also maybe the ways in which it has triggered certain memories in you of when you were a child? Yeah, when, when um, I never wanted to become a father, and I've told my children that, so, I, so I'm not betraying a secret or anything. <laughs> Already messing uh, them up. Yeah, hmm. and I remember when you know, I realized, oh, I'm going to become a father for the first time, I thought, and I was in the middle of writing The Sympathizer, the first draft, and I thought, ugh. My life is over, um, and 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 the arrival of my son was the, the literal deadline for finishing the book. I finished the book like three days before he arrived, and then I, I I revised it over the next three months while he was just a blob lying on the the futon in in his mom's office. And I'm, I'm I and my I had the night shift, so I would revise the novel 
and uh, uh, until three in the morning. And then anytime he stirred, I would stick a bottle of formula in his mouth. He loves his story, by the way. He loves it. He's like, oh, that's why I'm so fat. He's like, or I, I was so fat. Yes, you were so fat because I, that's how I pacified you. And then at 3 a.m., I, I would be done with my writing and then I'd sip on my formula, which is single malt scotch, until his mom woke up at five and took over. So, I mean, it, that, that was the beginning of my experience of care for another person besides my, my, my wife. And this realization, of course, that you know, as parents, we're responsible for these new people. And it did have an effect on me. I think you know, it, it, I discovered that. In, look, my, when I was when I was growing up in my parents' refugee household, I was I felt numb. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I felt emotionally numb, and I talk about it in the book. Um, and I I found it impossible to say I love you, and uh, you know, that's a very common Asian stereotypical kind of a story. But it was also deeply rooted in this emotional numbing that I felt like that I subconsciously had to do to survive what was taking place in this refugee community. And so I, one reason I didn't want to become a father was because I thought I wasn't going to be able to love somebody. I mean, I was deeply, deeply mm. afraid of that and that I would really mess up this other person. And so it's been a real um, amazing experience for me to discover, in fact, I am capable of loving uh, the, my, my children and other people and other children as a result of that. So that, that was an emotional experience that I never thought I would have. So I'm, I'm grateful uh, in the end for being forced to become a father. And, 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 and you're right, in that I find optimism. You know, I find optimism, we're all gonna die and uh, some of us will leave children behind. And, and let, me, let me say this, I don't, I'm not trying to be sentimental. I'm not trying to moralize here. I'm not trying to tell people in this room, get married or partnered up and have children. I'm not saying that. You know, if you want to stay single and childless, good for you, okay? And in fact, some of you who have become parents probably shouldn't have become parents. Uh, I mean, honestly, if you go by, by the statistics, something will go wrong for some percentage of these parental child relationships. Um, I don't know how ours is gonna turn out, but so far so good. Uh, but that's just for me. Um, and so I, 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 having children does make me more aware of my mortality and these questions about the afterlife and so on um, that I have to confront. And it also makes me a little, a little bit more optimistic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just have, I've just published, finished a children's book. It's gonna come out in May. It's called Simone, named after my daughter. And it's about a, a Vietnamese American girl who confronts wildfire, wildfires that force her to flee from her house. And it ends not with her house burning down, but with optimism. That you know, even in the face of this climate catastrophe, she finds hope in the stories of her mother and in the artwork that the little girl does as a way of coping with the situation that she finds herself in. So for the sake of my children and children in general, I do think that I've become a little more optimistic. <laughs> um, I'm gonna poke at you a little bit here, because you do, you do talk about it in your book. How, can I get a sense of who has read the book already? Okay, nice. the memoir, the memoir, yes. Um, okay, well, I won't spoil it for the rest of you, but there is a really fascinating shift in perspective from first person. The first 18 pages are written in the first person, and then there's this switch over to the second person, which lasts for the whole like middle section, like the whole third of the book is in, written in the second person, um, and it gets very political. It sounds like your Facebook rants, but like very articulate. <laughs> Um, and it's about America and, and all of that stuff. Um, and it's brilliant. And then it gets vulnerable again at the end. And I've heard you say that you have to earn, uh, you have to earn the privilege to cry with him. Um, so I, I feel like the middle section is making people do the work of getting back to the emotional part. But the, the shift back to the first person is so interesting and that's where I feel like it gets uh, soft again. But I noticed when the shift happens, it's in a moment that would otherwise be by a lesser author be called a traumatic childhood memory. You don't call it that. You just give us what happened. Um, your you were at home, um, and your parents who were working overtime at the uh, grocery store that they ran in San Jose were shot in a robbery, um, and your brother came home to tell you that. And your first reaction was perhaps to laugh. You don't really remember, and you were very little. And then um, he asks you what's wrong with you and then in that moment you stop writing in the first person and you start talking in the second person for a long time um, and that to me was so powerful as just an illustration of how it happens um, and then you also talk about uh, in another part you talk about how uh, when Ellison your son was I think four years old 
that's when it, you, you remembered this other memory of yours from when you were four years old. So has the experience of becoming a father also like changed you as a writer then by unlocking these core memories that maybe you tucked away because they were just too painful? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um... Yeah, when my you know when my, my brother told me the news, I, I was watching cartoons, and uh, it was like Scooby Doo Christmas cartoons. I mean, it happened on Christmas Eve of all th- of all times, and and so yeah, I remember just not being able to react. Like, how do you react to that news? Right. You know, I mean, and of course, a human being would cry. <laughs> That's what I thought. A human being should cry at this moment. And so my, my brother says, "What's wrong with you?" I, he didn't mean anything negative by it, but uh, to me, that stayed with me. Like, right. there is something wrong with me. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not capable of reacting in a humane fashion to this horrible thing that has happened to my parents. And that was just a symptom of many other kinds of, you know, moments of me shutting down emotionally in, in the face of watching them, uh, uh, my parents undergo uh, various uh, kinds of struggles. And um, I think that um, the reason why the book goes into second person for a long time is because that's part of a traumatic experience. You know, you're disassociated from yourself. And so I went through, you know, decades of being disassociated from myself without realizing it. And I needed to, again, the only way for me to write the memoir was to actually inhabit that experience of looking at myself from the outside. And then by the end, I guess you could say there's wholeness because I returned to the first person in the last third of the book to talk about my mother's illness and her breakdown. And that's the part that most people ironically love the most because that's the part where the book fulfills its memoiristic uh, design. Again, you pick up a memoir in order to go into the emotion. You want to feel the pain. And, and ironically, it's someone else's pain you're feeling. Um, and I'm willing to give it to you, but as you said, I'm gonna, I, I wanted to, I did not want the reader to start there, you know, because I felt that, again, that would just be me giving in to the demands of the memoir audience. The memoir audience is like a very demanding audience. We want you to suffer, and we want you to expose your suffering, and we want to feel better after reading about your suffering. <laughs> oh, fine. Okay, you, you'll get it. But you're going to get my version of how my family ended up here in the first place. Yes. Um, I have so many more Valentines to give you, but I do want to give the audience a chance to ask you questions as well. So I just wanted to give you this one um, because you point out a lot. You have a lot of things you like to critique, but (laughs) you had such a lovely description of the artist colony where I got to meet your child and where the idea for Chicken of the Sea was born. I'm just going to give you this to hold. Um, and you describe, <laughs> you describe this colony as where one can experience what socialism probably feels like or should feel like, which is to say a kinder version of capitalism with a wealth of resources and choices, minus the exploitation, greed, and soul-crushing alienation, as well as a kinder version of communism with a commitment to justice and collectivity, minus the paranoia, secret police, and re-education camps, allowing one to be creative, playful, and free. That should be their like description under oh, yeah, their perfect. Yeah. on their website, right? Um, And I I also have an interest in utopias. I know that they are probably temporary because as you also write in this book, humans will find a way to muck up anything. But um, That's not the word I used. No, I I don't know if I'm allowed to cuss (laughs) here. Um, But so I guess like even if they're only temporary, even if we all die, we can still strive for these utopias. And I think this is where you and I share a similar kind of optimism and bit of activism sometimes uh, in our like in what we choose to put our energies into, um, I guess. So I, I don't know. What would you like to see more of? I think if we lived in a world in which everyone had the opportunity to have sabbaticals and attend artist colonies, we'd be a better world. I mean, I mean, I don't know how many of you have had the chance to be in an artist colony. It's pretty amazing, but that should not be a privilege for the artist at the you know at the behest of a of a of a of a, of a, of a wealthy donor. That should be the way our society operates. And so I think I, you know, one of the, maybe the last note I will end on with this book is that it's a playful book in the best way. You know, in, in other words, you know, to be a writer for me is to be playful. Mm-hmm. And it, it, to become a writer has been a process of me trying to actually un, to take apart decades and decades of learning how to become an adult. You learn to become an adult, you acquire all these rules and conventions and boundaries and you know the game, et cetera, et cetera. You may be very good at it. And then I look at my children, I'm like, they don't have any rules, which is extremely irritating sometimes. Yeah. However, it also is incredibly playful. They just want to play. And their imagination is boundless. And, and, and that is a wonderful thing. And so the paradox for me as an adult, as a writer, is how do I 
still live within certain kinds of rules, but also achieve that childlike playfulness as well. And so even though this book has some very serious topics and everything like that, if you read it, it's inc- I think it's very playful because it it try, it, I try to disregard all kinds of rules. Here's the last thing. Poets, I, and I draw a lot of inspiration from poets in the way this book is written, but it's not poetry. But poets have no rules. I mean, when you pick up a book of poetry and the poet does something weird, you're like, yeah, the poet. They, they're a poet. Of course they do weird things. But prose, for example, when I wrote The Sympathizer, there's no quotation marks. I can't tell you. This is the one biggest complaint readers have had. Why are there no quotation marks? I'm like, do we go around saying doing this all the time? It's just a stupid convention that we have come up with. And prose writers are bound by all these conventions. If you deviate just a little bit, suddenly you're an experimental avant-garde writer. I am not. I am just being playful in this book. And we should all have the opportunity to be playful. You're here. Okay, we might have time for one or two audience questions. If you can raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone. Thanks for your talk. It was very, very enlightening. I wonder if you could help me understand something I've wondered about for years. As, As you may know, it was at the basketball arena here at Tulane University that Gerald Ford announced the end of the U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. And almost a week after that speech, uh, Saigon fell. Um, And I was a student at Tulane in 1975 when that speech was made. And you have to believe that as president of the U.S., he could have chosen anywhere in the country to announce that, make that talk. Why did he choose Tulane, do you know? (laughs) I have no idea. (laughs) I think, I think, Mary, you have an an idea? You might have a good question, yeah. A question, okay. Sure. Yeah. My, my guess, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry, my, my, my guess would be if he, if he announced it at Harvard, people would pay a lot more attention. But I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a, I, you asked, I answered, yeah. So. Okay, sorry. No, thank you, Viet. Um, you mentioned audience, and that's something I've been thinking about throughout your talk. Um, you mentioned the memoir audience and what they're looking for. And I'm curious what your relationship to audience has been throughout your artistic life, and especially now with this show and stepping into this very like commercial world where, as you know, Robert Downer, Downey Jr. has been put at the center of your story. Um, what that conversation was like for you um, and what advice you have for other creators who are grappling with this idea of who is this work for? I think uh, the question of audience is, for me, actually a metaphor for our our own behavior as as individuals, okay? Because um, when I was writing, when I started off as a writer, I was very conscious of audience. I was conscious of the fact that I, I, you know, I wanted to write for Vietnamese Americans, but I also wanted to write for The New Yorker and editors and agents and reviewers who were mostly going to be white. I couldn't get that audience, these audiences out of my mind. Um, and so the refugees, I think it's a pretty good book, but it's still a book written with attention towards whatever these audiences happen to be. And I was so exhausted after writing that book, it took me 17 years of struggle to write it, and I wasn't even sure it was going to get published. And so then I wrote The Sympathizer. And with The Sympathizer, I decided I'm going to write for myself, and I don't care what anybody else thinks. And that was, I think, a moment that, I, that, that was very freeing for me. And the reason why I think it's a metaphor for life in general is we spent, many of us spend our lives worried about audiences. Like who, who are these people, how are these people gonna judge us, et cetera, what kind of rewards and penalties can that bring? And then it's freeing to just live your life for yourself. And so for me, it was very freeing to write just for myself. Um, and I've encountered other artists who have said that, yeah, that, that was the breakthrough psychological moment when you seize caring about other people's expectations of your work. That doesn't mean that, that I gave up on the idea of audience altogether. I mean, I certainly, did, but my idea of audience was that it was concentric. My first audience after myself would then be my wife, then my agent, then my editor, then uh, Vietnamese Americans, then Asian Americans, then Americans, then the world. So I understood that there was still a pragmatic concern, but my, and my feeling also was that I got very lucky with The Sympathizer, but at the same time, the reason I got lucky was because I wrote it for myself. 
So you know, you won't, no one can predict that you write a book and then it becomes an HBO uh, TV series. However, if I had not written it for myself, I don't think it would have become an HBO TV series. And so again, you get to that contradiction that now all of a sudden something that I wrote for myself is a $100 million production that's going to go global. Um, and, you know, a $100 million production based on two years of my life that no one cared about. That's a kind of a fairy tale story, but I think that the, the, the roots are still the same, that as an artist, you still have to be committed to whatever your own inner vision happens to be. That's the only authenticity I believe in, is the authenticity of your own self and your own uh, vision. I don't believe in the authenticity of the community. I don't believe in the authenticity of culture or anything like that. Because um, there's so many different, different versions of that. There will be Vietnamese people who look at this TV series and will say it's inauthentic. And there will be others who will say it's authentic. And I can't worry about that. But the book itself is authentic to my vision. Now, the problem is it then becomes amplified through a gigantic corporation and, and the marketing mechanisms. And, and Robert Downey Jr. is obviously the marketing mechanism. And I have no problem with that because I mean, literally, the budget went up 50% when he signed on. Um, but when you, that's the lure. You know, people are like, oh my God, it's Robert Downey Jr. And he's been great, you know. Uh, props to Robert Downey Jr. You know, had lunch with him. He does a great job watching all, you know, performing four roles in the movie, TV series. However, if he's the lure, once you turn on that TV series, you're going to see Hua Swan Day, a relatively unknown Vietnamese-Australian actor, in almost every single shot for seven hours. And you're going to see a cast that's 90% Vietnamese. And you're going to hear a show that is, there's a lot of English, but it's at least 30% in Vietnamese. So that's the price to be paid at that, at that level. And uh, that was, that was the, the compromise that I thought that we could make. Because here for finally, finally, we, after watching literally decades and decades of American takes on Vietnam and the Vietnam War and, and mostly white male and some black male perspectives, you're going to get seven hours of mostly Vietnamese people talking about Vietnamese things. Whether you, whether you agree with it or not is not the important part. It's just the sheer presence of that much screen time devoted to, to Vietnamese people that I think will have a material, emotional, psychic impact. I love a Trojan horse. Yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I shout out one person? We actually need. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we are running out of time, but I just want to shout out in the, in the spirit of narrative plenitude that Viet always talks about, uh, a great Vietnamese-American book that was written here in New Orleans by a local author, E.M. Tran. Daughters of the New Year is uh, amazing and it has a really uh, uh, great cathartic end. I think believe the author's in the room. Right there. Hey. Yeah. Thanks so much, T. It was really a wonderful uh, conversation. You know me so well. And, and thanks to all of you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you so much to our panel.